Hi everybody, this is Early Medieval Embroidery and I'm Alexandra Makin and today I'm going to talk to you about one of my favourite surviving examples of Early Medieval Embroidery, the Kempston Fragment. On the 18th of January 1864, Reverend S. Edward Fitz noted in his diary that a grave of a woman had been opened at the excavation site of Kempston, Bedfordshire. The grave was later recorded as, quote, probably Grave 71, although this is ambiguous in the original publication. By the right leg of the deceased was a bronze box in which pieces of fabric were found, including a fragment of woolen material. The embroidery was not described until 1990 when Elizabeth Crowfoot published a paper on so-called work boxes in which she included a discussion of fragments found within them. The site of the Anglo-Saxon cemetery is located in a gravel pit approximately two miles west of Kempston. The cemetery contained graves of men, women and children with no regular orientation and many personal possessions. Because of the grave goods, Fitz noted the cemetery must be pre-Christian in date um, and therefore before around 700 um, CE. Although he doesn't specifically assign the gra grave in question a date, um, all the published research asserts that it probably dates to between the mid to late 7th century. The function of bronze boxes is obscure. According to M. Foreman, most are found in Derbyshire, North Humberside and Yorkshire, while a smaller um, numbers come from Wiltshire and Kent, um, and there are similar examples on, um, on the continent as well. They have been called work boxes, relic boxes and herbal or first aid boxes because they often contain small samples of organic material. All except one have been found in female graves and the exception being from a child's grave that's up down in Kent. Those found in situ were lying next to the left or right hip of the deceased with other objects usually associated with the chatelaine. They're cylindrical in shape, made of bronze and small, measuring on average no more than 12 centimetres in length and six centimetres across. Each has a tight fitting lid, either hinged or separate, and most have a metal hoop that would enable them to be hung. Now, recent research by scholars in Cardiff has been used to create a chronological framework of Anglo-Saxon graves and grave goods from the 6th to 7th centuries. And researchers are able to situate boxes within this chronology, um, dating them to the 7th century. The meaning and use of the boxes is still debated, but the most promising theory to date being that they are relic boxes containing small relics precious to the owner. They were part of a transition phase from old pagan beliefs in amulets morphing into new Christian faith in relics. And what is clear is that the boxes can't be work boxes. They're too small to contain all the items used in textile work. There's also the issue that the fragments found within them often come from already constructed items that have lost their original use. Although the term workbox has persisted in published literature, the evidence demonstrates that actually it's not an accurate title and a relic box would be more accurate. <clears throat> the Kempston fragments are now stored in the British Museum and you can go onto their um, online database and have a look at uh, some lovely high definition images of it and I've included the link to that um, below. They've, um, as I've said, they've been photographed using high um, digital cameras so you can really zoom in and capture the detail. The images show that the woolen fragments consist of three pieces. However, in Crowfoot's photograph, they are more numerous uh, with the central section split in two. It's not known whether the two central pieces should be joined together or were originally attached via another piece which is now disintegrated. Although when you look at them, you can see that they do the pattern does follow on quite nicely. Embroidery covers the majority of fragments. The three smallest pieces, um, one on the left and two on the right of the large central ones, are completely covered in embroidery. The largest fragments clearly show defined areas of embroidered and unadorned ground fabric. Together, the surviving pieces measure approximately 24 by 54 millimetres. 
And the embroidery is 33 millimetres long and between 9 and 11 millimetres high. The individual stitches are one millimetre in length. The ground fabric is a worsted twill, um, which means it's, it's a fine fabric. And although it's too covered in embroidery to be able to distinguish the weave clearly, it's probably a broken diamond tool. The embroidery threads are a fine plied wool and a previous analysis um, done under Elizabeth um, Crowfoot established that the colour of the ground fabric was purple while the embroidery threads are white or yellow, um, blue or green and red. I'm not aware of any further tests or analysis um, that determined the type of fleece or dyes um, and therefore the exact colours. However, when um, you look at the British Museum uh, photographs and the microscopic images that I took when I examined the embroidery, um, the colours described are as accurate as it's possible to gauge without more detailed scientific analysis. The embroidery is very fine. Crowfoot noted that it was worked in stem stitch, each area being filled with a double row and outlined with a single row. However, looking at the embroidery in high resolution and microscopic detail, it seems that at least one of the central areas is filled with chain stitch. Um, and this is particularly clear at the bottom left of the design, uh, which is worked in the, the blue thread. The microscopic photographs also seem to show one split stitch worked um, in, on the white band that lies over the blue band. The split stitch is worked on top of the previous stitch um, and I'm aware that this observation may prove contentious. Um, the thread may be thinner at this particular point which could make the stitch look like a split stitch when it's actually a chain stitch. Um, however, even taking this into account, the thread doesn't look plied like the rest obviously are. This suggests that the plied thread has been split when the succeeding stitch was worked, thus forming a split stitch. Um, following this, the chain stitch continues um, to fill the band until it reaches a break in the design where the fabric and the embroidery have disintegrated. The band seems to continue along the second piece of fabric, which, um, as placed next to the first during conservation, forms a curve that bends down to the right. The stem stitch outline of the band continues until it meets the blue band running horizontally along the bottom of it. The filling of the white band runs to the top of the curve and then breaks off. The last stitch before the break has not, been, has not disintegrated or unravelled um, and there are a couple of separate small stitches in the break before the filling begins. So the surviving work indicates that the embroiderer made at least one mistake with the split stitch, which was corrected as she went along. And the second oddity in the break may or may not have been another mistake. Um, but the remains suggest either the embroiderer missed a couple of stitches or pulled the thread too tight as it was worked, thus producing um, two or three smaller individual stitches, or the still complete last stitch could before the break suggests the embroidered filling may have originally run unbroken along the band but in a number of stitches have disappeared leaving behind small casting on and off stitches. If so the last complete stitch is the final one made with the old thread. It was cast off and a new thread was started hence it's not unravelled while the stitches worked after the break are not as complete. Although not clear, a filling stitch on the overlaying band at the top of the design may also be tentatively suggested as stem stitch. The photograph appears to show stem, stem stitch in white thread running from the bottom left to the top right. If this example is accurate, it points to the wide central areas of the bands being filled in the wider chain stitch and the narrower areas being completed in the thinner stem stitch. In turn, this would mean that the outlines will work first and the filling completed afterwards, uh, with the type of embroidery stitch chosen um, to fill the area as required. 
The microscopic photographs also suggest the order of work for each section of the embroidery. Overall, it would seem that the fragment was worked left to right. The stem stitch outlines were worked first and the filling second. Whether the fillings were completed um, after the outline for its after the, all the um, outlines were worked or after uh, one section was worked and then filled in um, is more difficult to decipher, um, particularly without seeing the back. And as you can see from the images, the, um, the peak fragment is now attached to a conservation fabric, so you can't see the back of the embroidery. Although the stem stitch outlines um, slightly overlap each other in certain places, the filling stitches could have been worked later and the needle slipped underneath the outline that crosses um, the area, which results in the thread line neatly as it passes to the back of the ground fabric and just underneath that out crossing outline. In her discussion, Crowfoot, and here I'm in no way dismissing the work she did on um, archaeological textiles. She is um, a pioneer um, in this area of research and her contributions are still extremely valuable today. Um, but in this particular instance, she suggested that the embroidery formed a scroll border with possible leaves and a bud. Um, and you can see a drawing here um, that she did, giving you an example of what she thought it looked like. She pointed out that although the acanthus leaf scroll had been found on a cloak um, from a rich 10th century grave in Mammon, Denmark, um, which is now part of the Fashioning the Viking Age um, project, and I'll include the link to that below, um, this and um, this theory has been accepted by researchers. Um, there are a number of problems with it. Firstly, the drawing Crowfoot made is not completely accurate when compared to the high resolution and microscopic images that um, weren't available in her time. Um, secondly, and taking into account the lack of accuracy of the drawing, the embroideries outlined, they obviously don't look the same. Finally, the dates of the two embroideries. If the 7th century date for Kemp, the Kempston fragment is accurate, um, apart, they're three centuries apart. And this isn't to say that embroidery styles and techniques weren't continuously used over long periods of time. I mean, we still use um, the same fibres, types of fibres and the same stitches today. Um, but the evidence combined with the dates does make it seem a little bit more tenuous, creating the need for a more detailed study of the fragments. So the first step was to redraw the embroidery. So to achieve an accurate drawing, the design was traced from a colour print of the a British Museum photograph, um, while there was an enlarged digital version on screen, um, and the microscopic images uh, were used all for cross-referencing purposes. The result's really interesting. Um, the first difference between um, this drawing and Crowfoot's is that where her drawing um, could be interpreted as a single line of stitching, it is in fact a central band outlined on either side with red thread, thread just as Crowfoot stated in the text. Secondly, where Crowfoot's drawing continues unbroken from the left side through um, the centre to the right, there's actually that break in the ground fabric forming the two separate pieces, um, which although joined together in the photograph are still visible. Thirdly, the original drawing does not show all the detail that can now be seen through the high resolution and microscopic images. The redraw de redrawn design is um, more intricate than a Crowfoot's original demonstrated. Um, and as a result, it does look less like an acanthus scroll. The coloured thread seems to have been used systematically. The red thread is consistently worked as the outline. The white thread is used to fill in the band that runs from the left side through the centre to the top right of the design. The blue infill appears to the right of the embroidery, lying adjacent to both white sections. 
The colour also appears on the band to the left of the design, lying partially underneath the white band. Therefore, it's possible to say that the blue thread is not infilling leaves and buds and the white thread does not only give colour to the curve. Instead, each colour follows its own trail within the design. From this reassessment, I suggest that the fragment is actually part of an entwined knot or beast motif, similar to those found in metalwork and manuscript illumination of the 7th century. The entwining of the two different coloured knots or beast motifs, in this case one white and the other blue, wrap under and over each other in a manner extremely similar to the entwined knots on the Brachiat die from Castle Dyke South Burton on Humber and the shield strap from Mound One at the ship burial at Sutton Hoo, Suffolk, both of which date to the early 7th century. The design is also similar to the early 7th century Great um, gold bottle also found at Mound One and the animals that inhabit the borders of the carpet page from the Book of Duro which dates to around 680 CE. The embroidery further enforces the idea of entwining in the white section at the top right. Here the under and overlapping design forms a tail which lies underneath another one before um, coming to an end. This can also be seen on the Brachiat die, the Sutton Hoo shield strip and a pair of clasps from the princely burial mound at Taplow, which again dates to the 7th century. The creatures on the metalwork and manuscript examples have been given an outline. The manuscript uses a different colour, while an indented line on the metalwork examples is used to show this demarcation. All the creatures in the Book of Dura are outlined in yellow or white. On the embroidery, all the animals are outlined in red. Interestingly, the creatures in the Book of Dura carpet page are painted in three different colours. Two for each border, red and yellow across the top and bottom, and yellow and green on either side. A light creature emphasised against a darker one in each case. The same can be seen on the embroidery, where the lighter white creature entwines itself around the darker blue one. Unfortunately, so little of the embroidered design survives that it's impossible to say whether the motifs are entwined knot or beasts. However, one of the bands seems to be bending around a green tail slash band um, in a similar manner to the tail ends on the Brachiac design and the Sutton Hoo shield strip. This stylistic evidence strongly suggests the embroidery itself dates to the 7th century. This evidence can be further supported by the writings of St Boniface, who died in 754. He was um, a missionary from early medieval England who travelled to Frisia and other Germanic states to convert pagans. In a letter he wrote to Cuthbert, Archbishop of Canterbury in the 740s, Boniface complained of monks wearing decorated clothing that demonstrated in his eyes their immorality. Um, the phrase translates as those dress ornaments embroidered with the widest of borders decorated with images of worms. With the archaeological evidence of the Kempston fragment, it's possible to test this translation. The ground fabric of the Kempston embroidery is purple with not beast motifs stitched on top. Due to the size of the fragments, it's not known whether the whole piece um, was dyed or if it only had um, purple stripes or borders. However, it is possible to argue that the garments mentioned by Boniface had purple stripes or borders that were embroidered with worm-like motifs, which were actually knots or beast motifs. If this is correct, it may be reasonable to suggest that the Kempston fragment had a similar design embroidered on it. Entwined biting creatures and knot work in this form are part of an artistic type called Style 2. This developed out of the earlier Style 1, which was popular in what's now um, Northern Europe and England very early in the early medieval period. Style 2 developed in Scandinavia at some point during the mid to late 6th century. As the style spread south into what is now southern Germany and northern Italy, it incorporated aspects of Roman and Byzantine design. 
It is this multicultural version of Style 2 with its stylized animals and symmetrical interlacing that eventually arrived in early medieval England in the 7th century. Here, the style took on its own unique um, identity, especially in the post-conversion period. We have already seen that the style was used in metalwork and manuscript illumination and possibly on textiles on the continent. The evidence from Kempston supports the idea that a popular design was transferred into embroidery. Such movement in styles and ideas is seen in later medieval textiles, so it's reasonable that the borrowing of ideas between different crafts took place earlier in the period as well. The entwined knot beast motif was extremely important in Germanic mythology. It represented the world serpent that circled the earth below the sea by biting its own tail. In turn, the imagery suggested, amongst other things, infinity, power and protection and healing. The serpent, as represented by the entwined knot beast motif, is seen in numerous um, early medieval English uh, works of art from the 6th to 7th centuries. It also became commonplace in Christian art, where it may have had a purely decorative um, function, or equally, it may have symbolised the power and protection of the new religion. It's likely that the motif represents one or all of these ideas, and the art form was used to bring forth their supposed power. It's all... all it's most likely the motif was thought to bring protection to the person who wore it on clothing and decorative metalwork, such as um, swords decorated with it in the conversion, uh, conversion in Christian periods. The stitch work is very fine, especially the lengths of the stitches, approximately one millimeter. Um, such fine, consistent technique demonstrates dedication and care in the production process even with the odd mistakes discussed um, previously. Personal experience has shown that it's not easy to keep stitches so small and neat throughout an embroidery. Um, the colours and the materials used are also interesting, including the use of purple on the ground fabric, a very fine worsted wool that can um, give it a sheen, which may have looked like a richer material when worked. It may be that this piece was made for a person with high aspirations or part of an elite rank of society. In order to do so, the embroidery in, was imitating new fashions um, in metal and other works in an affordable material. The embroidered knots and entire serpent motif may have been meant to give protection to the person who wore or carried it. There's no indication that this fab, what this fabric was originally used for. However, the fact that such a small piece was found in the bronze box continue, continues to suggest that it had protective power long after it had finished its functional use. Thank you very much for listening and watching. And um, If you've got any questions or comments, please um, put them in the comments section. If you liked this, then please give it a like. Um, and if you would like to know when um, new uh, vlogs come out then please feel free to subscribe thank you very much